Today's webinar is called Discoverability and Sharing Open Educational Resources, and it's brought to you by the CARL Open Education Working Group. Um, we're very, very lucky that we have Aaron Fields from UBC uh, presenting today, and Aaron is and has been our visiting program officer with CARL for the past uh, year, and is just wrapping up that contribution. We've been very, very lucky to have her with her with us. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Erin. Okay, thank you, Liz. So thank you all for joining me today. I um, hope this is a, a useful session for you. Before I get started, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the land in which I work and live. I think it's more important now than ever to um, Remember, even though we're in a virtual space, we're still on a physical space. So I work and live on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. The land it is situated on has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam who for millennia have passed on their culture, history and traditions from one generation to the next on this site. So just to begin, um, I wanted to get a sense of who I'm chatting with today and, and maybe just what you're hoping to get from this workshop. If you wouldn't mind sharing that uh, in the chat, that would be helpful. I see lots of librarians, few people in the teaching and learning centers, which is great. Oh, we've gone international with Massachusetts. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. So feel free to keep sharing just so that we can uh, get a sense of who we all are. Um, and Lise, I'm sure, is just taking a look to see if there's any particular questions. Uh, yes, uh, if you can mute your mic, that would be great for now. Okay, so there are some larger issues to consider when we're addressing discoverability and sharing for OER that go beyond how and where to share your content uh, to make it available for people to use. And I do wanna do just a quick overview of accessible and inclusive design formats and licensing before we get on to the discoverability and sharing pieces. Uh, when we are talking about discoverability and sharing, I will specifically talk about metadata a bit, as well as choosing a place or places to share your resources. Uh, we will also discuss uh, measuring success and impact, and particularly workflows around gathering data. Uh, and finally, I'll address developing a marketing and promotion plan for your OER that focuses on how to gain attention for the content you created and the benefits of promoting your work. So things, this is a complicated topic because I think we all understand that finding the discoverability, searchability is problematic with OER. And so I want to just lay out that I do not have a, a one system that's gonna solve everything because there are just many systems in which you can share content. There's no one process when it comes to sharing material. There are many processes and it, sometimes it'll dep depend on the format of the object. And then lastly, there's no one workflow. There might be several workflows, but the idea of just generating a workflow to understand where you're sharing content and then how to collect data about those open resources, I think is beneficial in itself. So it's all a, a large practice uh, and there's no one simple solution, unfortunately at this time. So what I wanted to start off with is just open consideration. So those bigger pieces when we're talking about making something discoverable and sharing it for other people to use. So often when I'm offering open education resource workshops, uh, the question people usually ask is what tool should I use to create my resource? And while that question about tool is really important, one um, as it's important because there are different affordances available to you. Uh, for each tool that you would use. Um, but openness is not necessarily where you create an object, but it's how it has been created. And true openness really depends more on just the creation of the object and putting it out in the world. It depends on accessibility and inclusivity, the type of format that it's been shared in, the licensing, and then where it's been shared. And often we forget those first three and skip to the, well, how do I get it out there? 
So I just want to think about open education um, practices and the first steps that we take uh, um, about making it openly accessible resource. So for creating open resources, we need to consider that openness really requires more than simply putting content online. True openness requires us to think about audiences' abilities to engage with the content when it's made available. Universal de design is a process of creating products, so devices, environments, systems, processes that are usable by people with the widest possible range of abilities and operating within the widest possible range of situations, so whatever environment they're in or condition or circumstance. So designing open educational resources that meet the standards of accessible inclusive design make the resource more faithfully open to a bigger audience and that's more discoverable and more useful. You want people when you make it discoverable to use the content. If you're gathering metrics, it's for the point that you want to see that it's being used. If we're not making it accessible or inclusive at the outset, we're already designing it to be less useful. So to develop accessible open education resources, here's some few considerations that you might want to use yourself or if you work with faculty for them to consider. So do I have visual materials that present core concepts that not all students may be able to see or understand? Do I have multimedia audio video materials that present core concepts that not all students may be able to hear, see or access? And do I have documents that present core concepts in a format that not all students may be able to access? So these are some core questions that have to happen before you start creating content um, and before you start sharing it. So just some basic uh, improvements for accessibility. Now, inclusive design is something much larger. These are just um, making content more accessible. Um, so it's slightly different. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about accessibility and inclusivity, there are toolkits from BC Campus on this, but also the webinar that, C, uh, that Carl offered on this exact topic would be useful to review, and that's on the YouTube playlist for Carl. Um, so some basic improvements, describing a visual using alt text, which is alternative text that's added when uh, to describe an image to text readers. It's also an image that would be described if the image doesn't populate inside of an open education resource. Uh, transcribing media, so adding transcri transcripts, text versions of the spoken word presented with multimedia resources. This adds two levels of um, use for the object. One for people who might have um, uh, an audio impairment, uh, but also if somebody wants to reuse your object and modify it, if a transcript is added, it's easier to make modifications because they already have a layout of what the video would contain. Descriptive hyperlinks, uh, making the text uh, readable, so ensuring that the colors and the size of font um, are to standard, as well as structuring the content itself. So I'm not going to get into more of that, but I just want to mention at the outset when we're talking about making something usable, we're really starting at the beginning. Uh, next, I do want to talk a bit about um, the format. So when creating OER, the format of the item you can create makes the resource more or less accessible. So for example, PDFs are a common popular format shared, but the actual document is accessible as in available to read, but not accessible for remixing, revising, and redistributing. And this becomes a huge problem uh, when somebody licenses an object for remixing and redistributing and revising, but you actually can't do that without recreating the whole object. So for an item to be modified for another user's purpose, the document must be in a format that is editable using a program that easily, that's easily accessible to the user. So to consider formats when developing an OER, ask yourself, can someone open the file without proprietary softwares like Adobe or Microsoft Office? Um, can someone edit the file with um, without the proprietary softwares. So there may be times when the resource you created requires you to use specialized software, like um, data visualizations, those sort of pieces. However, if you're creating a PowerPoint or a textual document, an image, you can save the item in a format that's editable across open source uh, softwares like OpenOffice or LibreOffice or GIMP Shop. So you'll notice here that there is a bit of a, um, a table that kind of outlines what is considered an open for remixing and revising versus what is not. 
um, for uh, Adobe and for PDFs. If you are going to create a PDF because that is your best format, you feel, uh, making sure that it is, um, you use the recognized text option to make it an OCR, so an optical character recognition, which allows the user to find the text, copy uh, the page and the content over to another format. So that, that at least makes it a little bit more accessible. And then lastly, I'm not going to go into licenses too, too much, but the license you choose for your OER will impact the level of openness or the ways people can use your open education resource. And then again, how it's shared and then reused. So the level of openness might impact how much people want to use it or will engage with it, um, either expanding it or shrinking it. So there is a difference between open as an accessible, which allows an individual to create copies of the object, retain it for um, other purposes, reuse it, uh, versus uh, open as in reusable, which allows the added ability to modify the original object and redistribute it with appropriate attribution to the original source or original resource. So these are some initial thoughts before you actually creating an object to make discoverable and share that you should consider in terms of getting the best reach for the actual object. So having the most amount of people use the content that you've created. So now we're going to mo move on to um, workflows around uh, discoverability and sharing. And I really say workflows because again, as a reminder, there is no one simple solution to making something discoverable and making it easily findable and gathering all the metrics about that object. Uh, we don't have one universal system. So when making decisions about sharing an open educational resource, you need to first have a sense of purpose and intent for sharing. We know that the internet is vast um, and you can send something out into the world, um, but not get any response with the object because you haven't had any intent behind where you're sharing it and why you're sharing it. So first thinking about when you're developing a workflow is asking some clear questions about, are you sharing your resource because you want, say, your students to have access to the item? That brings a different level of sharing of what you would do with the object. Are you sharing it for archival purposes so that you need a permanent URL? Or are you sharing it with a network of educators? And there might be more than one answer to this, of course. Answering these questions are really going to help you make a decision as to where you will share your resource and the type of functionality you need for the place you're sharing. So, when we're talking about um, workflow, this is what I'm going to be addressing today for this part of the workshop. We're really going to talk about um, the discoverability piece and talking a little bit about metadata and what you can do to standardize your metadata as much as possible. Um, it's complicated because there's multiple systems, so it's never going to be completely standard, but there are ways that um, metadata can be standard uh, by the creator of the objects, um, at least at uh, their personal level. Uh, sharing and measuring the impacts of the open educational resource and collecting those impact metrics. So first, the metadata piece. And there's a lot of librarians in the room, so bear with me here. Um, but it's always useful to, to think about the importance of metadata, especially in the context of open education resources. So, before distrib distributing an open educational resource, you'll need to really develop a standardized metadata structure. Now, metadata is structured, structured descriptive information that describes your object. So this information will be used when you upload and share uh, your OER to the different repositories and spaces. So for example, this is a, a UBC library record from our catalog of a resource um, and it's full metadata about the material. So the common metadata elements we have here, are the title of the item, the author, the publisher of the resource, the subject that the resource covers. And this is standardized inside of a library catalog. However, when we start going out into the open education resource world, there is no necessary standardization, which is why we often have problems with discoverability and finding of objects. And then there's also a summary of the object, so what it is contained inside of it. So the subject metadata is standardized in some repositories and catalogs to allow for resource on the same topic. So for in this instance, open learning and distance learning and MOOCs to be discovered when users search for that particular topic. So all those resources will come back. 
you will find when you share your open educational resources that some of the spaces may already have a set subject or topic metadata that you will need to use and or they might have both um, your ability to supply some uh, added uh, words or subjects for people to find your content. Uh, this is where you can structure your metadata across all of the different platforms. So just taking a look then at some common OER metadata um, structures from different uh, repositories. So we've done um, myself and uh, some of my um, student colleagues have done reviews of the different uh, open educational repositories to get a sense of what the common metadata structure is across all of them, even though the search functionality will differ. So developing a standardized metadata for your OER is necessary to ensure your object is described the same way across platforms where you have shared your content. Um, to, and the reason for this is to support the ease of finding your resource when people are searching. So for example, if you've shared your open education resource across 10 different repositories, if the metadata is the same across all of those places, you just should be able to find all instances of your resource when they're searching for it, say using Google. Um, you also want to make sure that you have the same structured metadata across so that there's accurate and appropriate attribution. Now, metadata structure may change across the different repositories, like I've said. However, there are some common fields that you will need to include. And this table includes some of those very common fields across all the repositories that we evaluated. So for example, the source type, so what is the media, who created it, or several authors the title, the publication date, um, if you have a permanent URL for the object, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the value of having that, you would want to include that in the metadata. Some subjects either supplied by the repository or supplied by yourself. Uh, an abstract of the item, the length of the item, um, who the audience is, and this is especially important in OER because OER streams across all um, uh, age levels and grades. Um, whereas when you're working with uh, open edge or when you're working with um, databases and sources with inside of an academic library, it's primarily geared towards, you know, university level. Um, so it doesn't need to have that kind of metadata attached, whereas for OER, it does. Uh, and then finally, the copyright and licensing piece. So people know how they can reuse your work. So Taking the time to uh, fill in the standard metadata descriptions that you can use across all platforms will make it useful so that you ensure that every instance of your item is using the same structured metadata. Now, before selecting a repository for sharing your OER, it's really important to understand the different types of repositories and what they offer. Um, you can use technically your website as a space to host your content. But what I am focusing on here are specific tools um, that have been developed, so repository spaces that can host in some way your open education resource for sharing. So first we have a resource archive and resource archives are repositories where you can upload a resource to the repository and it will live there. So it's a, a permanent kind of host. This is helpful if you don't want to host your resource yourself, for example, on your personal website or blog, but uh, you want to upload it elsewhere for others to find um, for it more, uh, for it to be found more easily. So a good example of a, a resource archive would be Wikimedia. Uh, you can upload like an image there or, or a textual document to Wikimedia and it's housed there with some some amount of metadata. It's not great metadata description, but there is some amount of metadata for your objects um, and that will exist within that space. Now, resource aggregators um, are repositories that collect metadata from um, they collect, sorry, metadata from resource archives or resources that are on other websites. So searching in this repository will provide with you with metadata and links which were uploaded to the collection. So it doesn't actually house the actual object. It just houses the metadata about the object and a link to somewhere else to find that object. 
These are helpful when you're looking for subject specific resources and the metadata must be entered correctly and completely. Otherwise, it might not be found by um, these sort of aggregators. So an example of a resource uh, aggregator would be the open textbook library. And basically there, it provides you a space to give the information about your object, the metadata about the object, and a link to where your object sits, so your open textbook sits, but that is it. And then it gives a search functionality and a browsing functionality on top of all of those records, but it doesn't host the actual object itself. Now, archive um, aggregator and aggregator, so a merging of the two, are repositories which host resources as well as gather metadata from other places. So it provides both options. These usually are, um, these are kind of third party platforms. Then they're usually run either by businesses or by nonprofits. And uh, essentially they usually have a paid for component on top of what they usually provide. Um, so for example, OER Commons, you can create an open education resource within their system, but you also can just add metadata and descriptive information about an object that exists in a different system, and it will be listed within their catalog. Now, you can also integrate that content into learning management systems, and it provides browsing and searching functionality. Now, where uh, cost is added is when you wanna create collaborative workspaces or group spaces, um, or you want some additional metrics about your objects that you've been posting, that kind of content usually has an added cost to it. And that's, I wanna talk about aggregators um, of repos. Um, now these ones are aggregators of repositories are not truly repositories in the same sense as the other three that I've mentioned where you can share your content but um, they are aggregators of other repositories. So this means that if your content is inside one of the other three, so if it was inside of OER Commons or inside of Wikimedia or inside of the Open Textbook Library, the aggregator pulls the data from those different sources and allows to search uh, across all of those platforms. So it's basically crawling those repositories in one searching, one search space. Uh, Mason OER Finder is one of those. It's a meta search of open education repositories. Um, and it does provide options to suggest a repository to add, but you cannot load an item in here. Now, the search functionality across aggregators of repos is very problematic, and that's because of the metadata piece I was talking about earlier. There is no structured um, consistent metadata across all of these other repositories so that the aggregator can search across them. So the search functionality is a bit complicated because it's just doing a lot of keyword searching and hoping to find stuff rather than more exact searching that we hope to see when we're using um, other databases from the library, say for example. So now that we have a sense of the types of repositories um, that are out there, we need to make a decision on where to share. So asking yourself the question about uh, like the questions that I've listed here may help guide um, faculty or yourself um, in making the right decision for the space to share your content. Because the fact is, is you can share across multiple spaces, but the more spaces that you share your content, the more um, upkeep there is for potentially the metadata or the object itself if you update that object. And of course, the metrics that you might collect about how your object is being used. So some questions to think about and doing some needs assessment would be, do I want people to access my OER from the repository or for somewhere else? So some repositories, like I said, allow you to upload the um, item directly to the repository. If not, then the resource must live elsewhere, like on a personal website or inside of an archive or repository. And then you can link um, to that object inside of um, that space. So you have to see whether, what is your, your needs? Do you need an archival space for your object? How flexible am I about the license I have chosen for my OER? Some repositories require the items to have a very specific license attached to them. And most repositories will accept a range of licenses, but there are some that are much more specific. So you have to consider what rights you want to give to an object before you select uh, the spaces that you're going to use. Do I want my OER to be peer reviewed or is peer review required for the repository? Peer review is offered uh, by some repositories as a service. 
Uh, in most cases, having your resource peer reviewed is not required, but some repositories like textbook repositories may require an evaluation of the item before it is allowed to be included. So this speaks in some ways to addressing quality and maintaining the integrity of the repository's original collection mandates. So you have to decide as to whether what energy you're going to put into that piece. What accessibility features do I want to ensure are available? So some repositories will have an accessibility guideline for the resource and some repositories will have special features such as being able to upload multiple formats, a video player or embedding video. Um, how important is the resource for indexing and searching? So if the repository is indexed, it will show up in some overarching search engines like Google or library search um, and just layers or databases, which in turn makes the resource more findable. So if that is important to you, that it is indexed in multiple places, understanding whether the tool you're engaging with has um, good indexing and search functionality should be looked into. Uh, do I want metrics to track how my OER is performing? So does the repository track data and is it able to provide information about how the resource is performing? So say the number of downloads, the number of times it's been cited, um, has it been tweeted about um, those sort of metrics and how valuable those metrics are to you. And finally, how important is it that the resource is archived? So there's a difference between posting an item uh, to be reused and remixed um, and making it available versus that it is archival and it will be a permanent space that hosts your object. So if it is important that your object has a permanent location and archive service that's available to you, you should probably investigate in that so it's preserved for the future. So then what does the workflow look like so far in terms of making an object discoverable and making it um, as shareable as possible? So first, the step one is to find, and this is in my feeling, and again, I, I welcome others' opinions when we have a conversation towards the end, but I think finding an archival repository to share your object is valuable because you know that there will always be a permanent URL attached to it. Whereas when we use some third party uh, spaces, we're not sure what is happening to that object over time. So I use for an example here in step one circle, which is UBC's open repository that focuses on those archival standards of making the item accessible. So once it is loaded, it is permanently available. Now, sharing your work in an institutional repository provides a lot of benefits, so support for submitting and indexing to make your content easily findable, indexing in high-profile search engines like Google, as well as academically focused search engines like uh, Google Scholar and Oyster, and making it quick and easy for scholars and others to find your work. Uh, finally, archiving of your work for long term. So Circle, Circle does provide that permanent URL, so the links to your material will remain the same over time. Now, I know everybody doesn't necessarily have access to an institutional repository, so you might have to investigate whether Merlot, which has been around actually is the oldest open educational repository and has solidly been around, is the best space to house um, your open education object to provide a permanent, more permanent space. But once you have that kind of permanent location for your object, you have to decide where do you want to share the metadata and link from the archive space to the OER aggregators that I mentioned. So for example, here like OER Commons, Merlot and AMSCR, if it's an applied science and math um, open education resource, basically the object will continue to have a permanent space with inside of Circle, the institutional repository, but the metadata for the object is going to be located in a variety of aggregator repositories for greater reach. So you will always make sure that you're collecting, um, collecting metrics from those spaces from OER, Merlot, and AMSR, but when people actually download your object, the downloading is going to be coming from the institutional repository from Circle. Um, so again, if you're not affiliated to an institutional repository, look at those archive aggregators like OER Commons or Merlot to house the physical object as the step one and then share across the other spaces. And we'll talk about step three in just a moment, but I do want to add that um, the sharing workflow is a little different for open textbooks. I've primarily been focusing on open education resources in a very broad way, but for open textbooks, there is some added workflow. So 
when you're sharing uh, an open textbook, you want to think about um, already existing systems that can uh, share that object out more broadly. So I'm thinking about textbook catalogs and library systems. So first, you're going to want to uh, secure an ISBN for the object. So the International Standard Book Number is a system of unique identification number for books, pamphlets, uh, e-books, so electronic books and publications. And once an ISBN has been assigned, uh, it acts as a unique international recognizer and identifier. So if somebody has that 13-digit um, that number, they will be able to find your object. But it also has a lot of added benefits uh, for the object, for the open education resource. One that uh, if people need to cite your textbook, sometimes it requires in the citation style that you have the ISBN. But also uh, legal deposits required by Canada um, an ISBN for uh, electronic books or books to be deposited in Library and Archives Canada. So if you acquire an ISBN, your content can be inside of Library and Archives Canada catalog. Also, the legal deposit provides better access to an open textbook, which will now have a space in the Library and Archives Canada to download. So again, it's making it more visible and available inside of already existing catalog systems. But there are all also open textbook catalogs that aggregate open textbook materials into one searchable interface. And an example is the BC Open Textbook Collection. As long as you pass a, a textbook inclusion criteria, your textbook can be added to that collection. The benefit of this is that one, you're, you're amongst a variety, a catalog of other open textbooks, again, making it more findable because when people seek an open textbook, they will go to that catalog. But also the um, textbook collection for BC campus uh, develops MARC records. Now MARC records is the metadata that the library uses. So when I showed the library metadata that we use in order to make an object available with inside of a library. So when the metadata record is created, the library has the option to pull in those records into our catalog, making it available within our own institution but also it can make it available inside of our search and discovery layers as well as in databases. So basically we have the option to turn on, <laughs> forgive that term, but that's literally what it is. It's clicking a button behind the scenes in our systems to say, I want this open textbook collection to be searchable using my library systems and it will be made available. Now, the best way to learn about the workflows around making your open textbook available is going to be through your local library system. Uh, so you would want to contact the library, but there are options to make it available so when people are searching in the library, they can find your content. So now that we have a sense of kind of the workflows around uh, making something discoverable, we have to talk then about the impacts uh, and what, what are success metrics. Uh, and I just want to focus then on the, uh, in the chat to see, to think about what we need to make decisions on when we're collecting metrics, because you can collect a lot of data, but uh, that data is only important if you have a reason behind the collection. So I would like people to share just in the chat, what do you think the data is most important for your institution around open educational resources, but what would be the data that's most important to you or to uh, your faculty if you support open education on your campus? And if you can just share that in the chat function, that would be great. So Erin, I will, do you want me to read out some chat? I actually can see it. Oh, Hopefully wow. it won't break things. <laughs> Yes, versioning is a extremely difficult issue when we're talking about OER. And if people are wondering what versioning is, it's when uh, open education object has had modifications to it. How do we track that new version of the object? So number of uses for open education resource, adaption in courses, yep. Credit and attribution, tenure and promotion considerations, yep. Authority. So authority of the, the tool. Great. Okay, as those keep coming in, I'll just kind of um, continue. 
so why collect impact metrics? Um, <laughs> it's like, I think we've answered some of those questions in our chat and definitely the impact metrics we collect and report on are going to differ depending on who we're talking to uh, and uh, their reasons, what they call success for themselves. So more and more grant requirements are asking for uh, impacts, uh, whether those end up being specific data points or metrics, but that is a requirement specifically when knowledge mobilization starts becoming a part of conversations. In many knowledge mobilization projects, their output when they're talking about engaging in community tends to be open education resource development. So that might be a place where that comes in. Tenure and promotion, as somebody stated in the chat as well, is that when you're making your tenure and promotion package that making statements about the relative impact of the work that you have done specifically around open education may add value to, and similar with merit and performance reviews and then finally the personal investment just recognizing that the effort that you put into an object and shared out that there is some return on that now what that return looks like will differ. And if you're talking about measuring the impact of your project in a student perspective way, that's going to be slightly different than if we're talking about measuring uh, impact in a, just specific numbers and data. Um, so I think those are two like, separate questions. What I'm going to focus on though is primarily the metrics that can be collected using the tools that I suggested. Um, so, when, depending on where you decide to host your open educational resource, you may be able to take advantage of different platforms to gather analytics about the resources use. The data you can collect includes views, downloads, user ratings, comments, and while there may be many data options for you, you need to decide how you will use it and select what is most useful for your success measures. So having a sense of what is considered a success measure for myself will help you make decisions on what data is useful for you to collect. So just taking a look at three of the tools that I mentioned, there are different data collections that can happen with an object. So for example, with Merlot, you can look at user ratings. Merlot has an award system um, where uh, certain projects get awarded uh, each year. So that might be considered a, a metric if you get an award. A reward. Um, if your content is used um, or reused within their content builder and you can apply Google Met Analytics to that if you're deciding to host your object on Merlot, that's another level of content or metrics that can be gathered. OER Commons has a number of times viewed, the number of times saved, ratings out of five stars, and also comments. Uh, if you pay for the version of OER Commons Hub, there's also additional metrics available. And then when I look at CIRCLE, which is our institutional repository at UBC, you can see downloads by country, views by country, views and downloads by month and year, and total views and downloads. So before you collect all of this, because you can collect a lot of numbers, and especially if you shared in five, six, seven, ten different uh, spaces, you have to decide what kind of story you want your data to tell. What's the most useful data for you to collect and the reasoning behind that data collection? So to develop a workflow for collecting uh, impact metrics, and you have to really consider these following questions when developing out the workflow. So where will I look for the metrics? Uh, am I going to be looking inside of OER Commons, Merlot, the multiple places that I've shared? How often will I gather those metrics? So every year, every few months, how will I use the metrics? Am I going to use it for marketing purposes for my resource? Am I going to use it for reporting um, purposes on my tenure and promotion uh, portfolio? And then also make sure to assign the responsibility for the data collection reporting, because this is what often happens is we forget um, to collect that data, forget the spaces where we shared our content, and then those numbers are sort of lost to us. Then developing out an OER impact metrics spreadsheet, either using Excel or Google Sheets or LibreOffice. Develop out the categories for each space you will be collecting data and then develop the categories for the data collection. So that ends up looking something like this. So 
you have the resource that you shared, the link to that resource, when it was out, uploaded, the number of downloads, the number of views, because that's what I wanted to collect, and then the last time I've updated those metrics. And you make that, create a new tab for each of the repositories where you shared your content. So it gives you a better sense over time, the reach of your object. This does not address whether your object has had um, new versions at all because the problem is the tool where you've uploaded the content does not address the new versions either, unless you are starting from brand new with a brand new archival record um, of your object inside of the repository, in which case it's a new object and not see, it's not seen within the system as a new version, it's just a brand new object. And that's part of the issue here is that again, the systems are not diverse enough to deal with that complexity of modification of OERs. Now, lastly, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the marketing and promotion piece because this is the piece that most people forget. Promoting an open education resource is really gonna require you to develop a plan of activity. And unlike traditional publishing models where marketing and promotion are completed for the authors by publishers, Engaging in open education activity often requires some effort from practitioners and getting the word out about their resource and then again so people can find it and reuse it and it um, ensures that your object is being used um, more broadly. So first identifying your key audience is crucial for developing a plan uh, for promotion and you may develop uh, separate plans on different messages depending upon the audience. So if it's a K to 12 audience um, for uh, teachers and also language instructors at a university level. It's two different messagings and different spaces where you're going to share your object. So listen, here are just some few things that you would uh, consider when you're developing out a plan. Um, so using your communication supports at your own institutions, uh, notify your professional associations and related organizations, as well as using your own personal um, personal social media spaces. But I do want to show a sample plan. Uh, this is an example sharing plan that we engaged in for um, at UBC Libra Library with the uh, Global Storybooks Project, which is a multilingual literacy resource for children and youth and people who are um, English as a second language or French as a second language. Uh, the uh, faculty member who developed this had multiple audiences that she wanted to reach for a promotion of her open educational resource. So she wanted to reach educators in the K to 12, but also language instructors at all levels. So that would include um, uh, ESL instructors outside of the academy, but also those within inside of the academy. So for here, a plan was developed, two separate plans, one that actually focused on um, the and one that focused on the um, upper level. And what we found there was to develop out this plan, we searched existing repositories for communities and groups that existed where she could share her content, searched for organizations and networks with areas of interest, identified existing organizations and networks to engage um, with in her area of expertise and specifically for Global Storybooks Portal. Um, using academic social media to share the resource and identifying relative hashtags so that she could share out her resources through Twitter, as well as identifying existing listservs and communities of practice that support OER development and OER use. Because uh, often in those spaces, we're sending out messages about this new thing has been created that might benefit uh, faculty across, um, across uh, Canada or even more broadly. So sharing in those community of practice spaces. And what we did is we developed out that sharing plan so that the reach of her object, it increased the metrics, it increased the discoverability of her object as well. So finally, ah, 10 minutes, not bad. Uh, finally, just a, an overview of kind of like the flow chart of what I just uh, went through in terms of discoverability and sharing is we have our description and sharing phase where we develop some standardized metadata if it's an open textbook, there's a different uh, system that you should also consider. And I, I have a list here to an open publishing guide if you want to learn more. Uh, but for other open educational resources, we wanna make sure we have some standard metadata. We want to select 
the repositories where we'll be hosting and sharing, which can be two different things or the same. Uh, we want to make decisions on the type of metrics that we're going to gather. We're going to collect those metrics and then also develop out a marketing and promotion so that the metrics would then increase in terms of the use of your objects. So I will finish my chatting at this point. Um, but I would like to just send out there to everybody who's in the chat, uh, if you have some other ideas for workflows and processes, you can engage in to share open educational resources because this is just a process in a very complex system. <laughs> and this is just rationalizing a system to try and make this work um, in a way that is beneficial for people, but isn't necessarily um, the only system. So, I open up the chat for that, but I'm also open to any questions that you may have. Um, Lise, what would be the best way to deal with uh, the questions? Well, I have, I've been keeping track of some of the questions people have oh, posted, great. so I can pose those to you. I think a couple of them got addressed as part of your presentation. Um, so, <laughs> I know we have a question, um, Let's see, we have a question from Patricia, which I thought was interesting. And she was asking, uh, why would you attach an ISBN to your, um, sorry, to your open textbook as opposed to a DOI? So I thought you might wanna talk about the distinction between those two. Oh gosh, that is a really good question. I'm assuming I, you have both, right? You can have both. Uh, the reason why the ISBN is because it has to run through the Canadian government and then is actually able to be located inside of the catalog, the Library and Archives Canada catalog. So it actually gives it presence there. The DOI, I don't think actually does that. The DOI is just a, a digital identifier for the object that if it's found somewhere that you can find it. So for me, it's about the um, location of it being in a space where people search. Um, but that doesn't mean that, the, that you wouldn't want a DOI as well. But I also, I'm interested if anybody else has any reasons as to why DOI might be a good space <laughs> instead even, <laughs> or both. <laughs> I'm just getting back to my questions. Um, there was some interesting discussion in the chat about um, about workflows for hosting OERs in institutional repositories, and that's before we got to uh, to your workflows. So mm -hmm. I think we could probably skip over that a little bit. But it was interesting to know there was interest in knowing who out there is actually including OERs in their repositories. So that might mm -hmm. be something people want to put in the chat as well. Um, there was a question from Leanna. Are there any initiatives to align OER metadata standards with RDA? So I don't know if you want to get into too much uh, metadata. Not that I know uh, of, and I am so keen to, to think about that and have that conversation. Um, I think the issue is, is that the focus initially with, and this is the same what happened with open educational or with um, open access repositories is we focused so much on making content available that we didn't think uh, initially about the need to really structure across all of the platforms in a way that would make it useful and inter provide a relationship so that we could make aggregators really useful. So no, I know of no, uh, no, I know of a lot of conversations about that being an issue but I know of no work that's being done in that area. And I think it's just because of the diversity of the landscape. The repositories are huge and varied. Um, so here's another kind of uh, direct question. Uh, Karen is wondering if you have thoughts about SUNY Geneseo's Oasis search tool. Um, I haven't actually, I don't know if I've played with that. Oh, just Oasis? I think that like, I, I don't. Is, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I don't know. It's. I think it has similar issues that also mo many of the repositories have, but it's probably the first one that I send people to when uh, we're doing searches. Yeah. yeah. And we did also get a question um, about provincial repositories for mm -hmm. higher ed OERs. Is it uh, are there provincial repositories or is it just institution by institution? 
as far as I know right now, it, there, it is institution by institution. And there, of course, is the open textbook repositories that are usually governed by uh, organizational bodies like BC Campus or others. Um, but as for provincial, no. I have heard here in BC, at least, that there was some discussion about a shared BC library uh, catalog system. Mm -hmm. um, but that conversation has been, I think, ongoing for well over, I don't know, like 10 years. Uh, and I think it's because they run into the issues that we're talking about with all of these repositories, which is we've built these things. And now to the amount of restructuring that would happen, have to happen in order to make them interrelate to each other is just astronomical. It's almost like having to start brand new. Um, my first thought is, is that uh, when we're talking about open education institutional repositories even, um, or not open education, open access repositories that many uh, universities have, I would like to see a relaxing of what kind of material is located in there. Those were built primarily for research material. And I think many are having the issue of including open educational resources into those spaces. So I think we have to maybe rethink uh, our institutional repositories and what they can be used for, which would then allow us to design them in a way that's actually beneficial for us to use them for open educational resources. Right now, I feel like sometimes I'm retrofitting and trying to make it work rather than it actually just functioning the way that it should. Like a good example is just having, um, this is for undergraduates in first year and second year of resource. That is not metadata that can happen inside of our open education repository, but that would be exponentially beneficial for somebody searching for open educational resources. So, so, so we just got a couple of minutes left. Um, I wanted to mention that Michelle Braley from the University of Alberta posted in the chat that uh, at the University of Alberta, they do absolutely use both an ISBN and a DOI. Um, right. with their uh, open textbooks. Um, and we did have a very direct question early on in the session mm -hmm. asking if we could get a link to the metadata template that you spoke yep. of. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, everything that is in here, um, well, like, of course, I can share the slides, but also share like a, f a folder of all of the templates that I use when I'm working with faculty. And maybe what we'll do is we'll update the slides uh, to add some extra links in there that can be useful to you if you want. And we will post those to the CARL website. And we're getting right up to the top of the hour. There's still some great chat notes coming in, which makes me think that we need to have uh, another community call soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if anybody has um, any questions that they would like answered or you can feel free to to just email me it's at the bottom of this uh this slide i'm happy to chat about this great thank you so much erin we really appreciate uh your time on this thanks again everyone for being with us